And will you pray with me? Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. Amen. I don't want you to be alarmed if you weren't aware of it, but this is the last Sunday in a sermon series. I didn't announce it beforehand, and in some respects I only discovered it as I went along. But these four uh, scriptures that we've been looking at this month from the 8th and the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark are all uh, of a critical passage in which Jesus is discovering and revealing to others in uh, bits and pieces, uh, ever so carefully and strategically. But Jesus is revealing uh, his understanding of his calling and his sense of purpose and his destiny as the Messiah. And so we've been really receiving uh, through Mark uh, an, a glimpse into Jesus' very self-understanding. And I've been trying to summarize uh, what in many ways is a, a synopsis of what I understand to be the gospel, the good news of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to save us, to deliver us from the power of sin and death. That's a good nutshell description of the gospel in my view. Jesus came to deliver us from the power of sin and the power of death. And we're not saved for our own selves and sake, but rather invited into a life of service to others. Jesus invites us to join in the baptism of his death and resurrection. We're invited to follow Jesus, even unto the cross, confident that we too will be delivered into newness of life when we follow in this way. And then we're invited, as we discussed last week, to live lives of servanthood, to pour out ourselves for others, and to create little glimpses of God's kingdom in which the hierarchies of the world are turned upside down. Jesus invites us to create an upside down kingdom in which the last will be first and the first will be last. Does that all sound familiar? <laughs> That's the sermon series. Today I want to suggest to you, as I close out this sequence of sermons, that Jesus is also inviting us into an inside-out kingdom, and that the kingdom into which we are invited is one in which we, we have to discover it inside ourselves so that we can share it with others an upside-down kingdom, but also the inner work, the spiritual work, an inside-out people we must become. So Jesus has revealed to his disciples this mission, this grand mission, and of course they immediately begin to bicker among themselves. Jesus is uh, having to confront what turns out to be uh, true for all communities and all Christian communities as well, that there are differences and divisions with any gathering of human beings, and churches are no exemption. Of course, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. I have a friend who's a church consultant, and after years of, churching with, uh, years of consulting with dozens and dozens of churches, he's rewritten that. And his version goes, wherever there are two or three gathered in his name, there you will find a disagreement among them. <laughs> I also heard someone say that the, the idea that, the, <clears throat> that in the church all should be brothers is the prayer of those who have no brothers. <laughs> and I've always, of course, uh, hankered after, I'd, I'd love, I've always been looking for a church that would be of a sing, where everyone would be of the same opinion. I'd love a church where everyone would be of the same opinion, uh, provided that it's my opinion, of course. This would be my preferred arrangement. But we don't get to live in communities that are of only our opinion, do we? That's not the way the world works, and it's not the way the church, which has to live in the world, uh, works either. And so the church across its vast history, 2,000 years, different expressions and different traditions within the body of Christ, the church universal, different traditions have sought different answers to this 
problem or different solutions to this puzzle, how to maintain unity when we know that within any community there are going to be differences of opinion. And different traditions of the Christian church, different branches of the Christian family tree have different answers to this fundamental question. Our Catholic friends look to the Pope as the source of unity, of, of what they think of as a universal church. The Pope is both symbol and seat of authority for Catholics. That's how they attempt to maintain unity within their communion. Uh, our Pentecostal friends, of course, look to the power of the Holy Spirit to break down divisions and by the power of the Spirit to bring people together across divisions of language and culture and class and creed. Of course, our Bible-believing or fundamentalist friends cling to the hope that the Bible somehow can remain the only source of authority and provide unity to the church. Uh, Quakers uh, look to the inner light, right? In silence, they seek the inner light and trust that the inner light will provide unity to their meetings. And then we have our friends who practice yoga. How many of you have children or grandchildren who practice yoga? There have to be a few of you. I knew there would be. Or perhaps some of you practice yoga yourself. Uh, I, halting, as a very, very halting uh, practitioner of yoga, I'm, I'm fascinated, though, by the respects in which the practice of yoga speaks to this same challenge. Um, you know, we talk a lot about spiritual but not religious people. I'm amazed at how widespread the practice of yoga is in our day. Uh, go down to walk around North Park sometime and you can't go a block without seeing people toting their yoga mats off to their yoga studios. And my experience of people who practice yoga is that they are seeking to quiet themselves and to assume certain poses and to practice the work of breathing and centering themselves so that they in turn can be more healthy and whole as they go out into the world and lead their lives. Um, I, I, I think it's not too distant to say that this is something of what we who come to worship are doing. Uh, and I, I think that if you run into a friend or a family member who practices yoga and they think it's curious that you go to church, you could tell them, well, think, that's just my yoga studio. We go, we stand, we sit, <laughs> we breathe. We sing, sometimes we do, sometimes we sing well, sometimes we don't sing so well. But we're trying to center ourselves and discover that inner peace so that we can then go out into the world and bring the spirit of peace to others. Well, our Methodist tradition has a particular answer, just like every other church tradition. We have our own answers to this question of how to seek unity when division and differences of opinion are all around us. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, of course, was an Anglican priest, and he always insisted that he was tremendously loyal to his mother church. But over the course of his career, he kept distancing himself from the authorities of that church. He was a very rebellious type. And at the end of his life, he even sanctioned the Methodists in America should form their own church. You know, John Wesley always insisted that he was the most uh, uh, loyal uh, and uh, unity-minded person, but his authorities the, in the Anglican church didn't think that. They thought he was a rebel and a dissenter. So John Wesley spent much of his career branching out from the Anglican church and then trying to communicate to his fellow Anglicans that he was not seeking division, but he was following his own call, and he believed it to be a call that was authentic to the tradition of the church, his home church, and the authentic to Christ himself, of course. It was, he understood his ministry to be rooted in Christ, in, rooted in Christ, born from the Anglican tradition, and then branching and flowering on both sides of the Atlantic. John Wesley wrote a famous sermon it's called a Catholic Spirit. That's the small c Catholic. Catholic, the word simply means universal, right? So when John Wesley was talking about a Catholic spirit, he was not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. He was talking about the universal spirit. And in that sermon, he tried to articulate to his many uh, um, 
his many foes, he had many who contested and, and criticized him. He was trying to convince them that his was a Catholic spirit, that he was not seeking division, that he was seeking unity among all people of faith. He used a maxim which was not his, but he popularized it and adhered to it throughout his life. He said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. This is one way that John Wesley tried to resolve this tension of differences within the church. In essentials, we must be united, he said, but in non-essentials, we must afford each other the liberty to practice and believe as we will. And then in all things, no matter what differences there may be among us, we must remain rooted in charity or love for one another. So this was John Wesley's uh, proposal that how we could remain united. Now in our day, we are learning the limits of this approach. It turns out as lovely as the maxim is and as useful as it can be in many circumstances, it doesn't always resolve things for us. And why? Well, because of course, we're gonna disagree amongst ourselves sometimes about what the essentials are. And what is an essential can be very different for different people. We're learning that in our very day, in our own church, the United Methodist Church, as we continue to grow down a path that will lead to division. The cards are on the table, I'm mixing metaphors, but whichever metaphor you choose, it's clear that the United Methodist Church will not remain in its current form. It turns out that some of us, this is across many decades, and you know it well yourselves, Across many decades, some of us have come to conclude that we can, we can simply no longer withhold the full embrace of our gay and lesbian children and brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors. We, we can't stomach it anymore to withhold the full embrace of our friends who are gay or lesbian or bisexual, transgender. But there are others in our denomination, of course, who have concluded with equally firm conviction that they cannot sanction the inclusion of gay and lesbian people in the institutions of marriage and ordination. And after decades of arguing over this, a, a generation or two, the die is cast and the, the United Methodist Church will not remain united in its current form. That's clear, I think, for all who are following this drama. Now, I know that this can be the source of great pain and mourning, and I believe that mourning is called for. And there are many friends and close friends and colleagues who have spent their decades building up the institution of the United Methodist Church, and the thought of it separating is extraordinarily painful. I mourn with them the loss of the unity of the United Methodist Church. But I don't want us to be too downcast about this, and I want to suggest to you another way of thinking about this moment in time. Of course, if we think of the church as the body of Christ, the thought of separating sounds horrible, doesn't it? It sounds like an arm being cut off or a foot being cut off. Jesus, in, his, in the lesson that he taught his disciples in Mark's gospel today, though, is using that as a caution for what this division would do internally to his disciples. He said, don't, right, don't cast them out. It would be as if you were cutting off your own arm. It's about the spirit of division he's cautioning against. We must not let the fact of division and difference do damage internally to our spirits. Am I making sense? And remember, Jesus used another metaphor. Of course, the body of Christ is one metaphor for the church, but do you remember the other governing metaphor that Jesus proposes for the church? In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what if in this time of the United Methodist Church's division, we are not seeing the 
painful cleaving of the body of Christ? What if we are seeing the branching? And is it not possible that our branch and the branches of others could remain rooted in the vine? Would that not be a more helpful way to think about this new day in which there are different expressions of Methodism or the Wesleyan tradition? What if we are branches? And let us trust that God, the gardener, will give new life, prune, but give new life to things that we might not yet even see. I believe that's a better way for us to think about this time. It, it speaks to the importance of us acknowledging the, the branching. This turns out it's a very Protestant thing to do. Uh, in October next month, I'll be doing a little three-week session on the history of religion in America, classes Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning. You'll hear about it in the next e-newsletter. And I'll be talking about this history within American, the American Protestant church. Turns out this is kind of what Protestants do. The word comes from protest, after all. You know, we do distinguish and branch and separate. Sometimes we fight, it's true. But the branching and the, the separation itself need not be that which defines our inner spirit. So can we live through this time of branching while remaining rooted in Christ, while outreaching to others who may choose a different path, path travel down a different branch, flower in a different place, and yet remain together in spirit? That, I think, uh, the invitation, it's an invitation that I think John Wesley, at the end of the day, understood. Because even after he argued with that lovely little maxim, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, even after he'd argued that, that's not how he ended his sermon, The Catholic Spirit. Turns out that we Methodists have our own sense of where true unity comes from. At the end of the day, Wesley understood that we are people of what he called a heart religion. And where Catholics seek unity in the Pope and our Pentecostal friends seek unity in the spirit, we Methodists are meant and invited to seek unity in the heart. And so he concluded his sermon, John Wesley did, after all the fancy argumentation, <laughs> he concluded this way, I do not presume to impose my mode of worship on any other. I don't ask you, are you of my church or my congregation? I don't ask if you receive the same form of church government or the same form of prayer. I inquire not, do you receive the Lord's Supper in the same posture and manner that I do? I don't ask whether you agree with me in the administration of baptism. I ask not whether you allow baptism in the Lord's Supper at all. These are things that we can let stand by. We will talk of them if need be at a more convenient season. My only question, he wrote, my only question is this, is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And if so, I say, then give me your hand. Is your heart right with my heart as my heart is right with yours? Then give me your hand. It seems to me but that's the best way for us to move out into the world around us. It's the best way for us to move into the future as Methodists, even those of us who have loved this church and tradition and have grown up in it and have worked long and hard to build it and to strengthen it. I think it's better if we allow for the branching and when we go out into the world, we may meet our once former denominational colleagues and friends who have chosen a different branch we may meet our Catholic or Pentecostal or friends from other church traditions. We may meet our very own children practicing their yoga. And wouldn't it be better than to bicker and argue and contest? Wouldn't it be better to say, the spirit in me 
honors the spirit in you. That's what a lot of yoga teachers say at the end of their class. Wouldn't it be better if we said, is your heart right with my heart as mine is with yours? Then give me your hand. Amen.